Good morning, everybody. I would like to um, start this session by, by first of all saying uh, thank you. Thank you to Didem and her team for the invitation to speak at this uh, prestigious conference. I'm delighted and, and I'm honored uh, to be here with you today. And I would like to thank uh, my sponsors, uh, Cambridge University Press, uh, for bringing me here. Thank you uh, to you, too, for deciding not to stay in bed. Um, voodoo economics and probably voodoo uh, teaching, too. If you asked uh, a group of colleagues what they um, thought were the factors responsible for the students' um, boredom, you would probably get um, some very different answers. A boring uh, teacher, lack of motivation, the wrong teaching approach, perhaps just a suspicion that the subject matter itself is not um, uh, extremely inspiring and exciting for those um, students. Well, these answers, of course, have all some truth um, in them. But ultimately, what really causes the students to behave the way they do is the students themselves, or uh, their brains, rather. And there is a key reason why their brains actually make them behave the way they do, and that reason is um, emotions. And this is what we're going uh, to look at in this um, uh, session, the, the role that emotions play in language learning, and I will claim it's a significant one. But you might want to point out, isn't language learning um, more about the brain, and therefore anything but the emotions, uh, such a skeptical thought wouldn't actually come as a surprise. After all, language learning is, is often associated with understanding complex um, grammar structures, uh, learning long lists of lexical chunks, words by heart, remembering syntactical constructs of all kinds, um, and so forth. In other words, uh, success in learning a foreign language is frequently associated with making a lot of mental effort. The separation of, of logic, higher order thinking, reasoning um, uh, from uh, emotions actually goes, goes uh, back about 2,300 years to the ancient uh, Greeks. Aristotle famously um, set out uh, his, his three elements of persuasion that, that any speaker, including uh, teachers, of course, must use in order to communicate a message effectively. Ethos, ensuring the audience perceives uh, the speaker as possessing credibility. Pathos, arousing in the audience uh, emotion, sympathetic to the speaker's uh, viewpoint, and thirdly, logos, uh, proving the truth of the message by logic and reasoning. The crucial part of this is that Aristotle, whose livelihood um, was, of course, provided by, by logic and reasoning, asserted that human reason is the most godlike part of human nature, life guided by human reason is superior to any other. For man, woman didn't exist in those days. For man, this is the life of reason since the faculty of reason is the distinguishing characteristic of human uh, beings. His clear approval of the combined ethos and logos has over the more than 2,000 years since he articulated this, this formula for oratorical success, been handed down to us uh, via the shakers and, and movers um, of the, the Western world and many other countries. Those two factors combined, combined have gained even higher status from their apparently unassailable um, position at the heart of academia and the scientific method. So they are strongly and deeply embedded in our overall view on the way the world works. We have scientific thinking and we have emotions and the two things have very little to do with one another. 
However, in recent um, years, pathos, emotions, um, has been brought to the forefront by cognitive scientists. Uh, indeed, of Aristotle, three elements of persuasion, modern thinking now compels us to, to give emotion considerable higher status than had previously been the case. Uh, this is a quotation uh, that comes from uh, Lazarus and Lazarus' work. They're two neuroscientists, and they stress that many myths exist about um, emotions. One of them is that emotions are irrational and don't depend on thinking and reasoning. Actually, they say emotions and intelligence go hand in hand, which is why humans, highly intelligent uh, beings, are such emotional animals. Um, one of the, the first language teaching uh, authorities that actually pointed at the importance of emotions in the uh, learning uh, and, and teaching and learning process was Earl Stevick. In his uh, book, uh, in his seminal work, Memory, Meaning, and Method, he stressed that emotions play a very important uh, role uh, while pointing out uh, that just how these emotional factors influence the process of memory is still the subject of some discussion. In this talk, I'll give you a big smile. In, in this talk, I'll be drawing on some new findings from neurobiology to discuss the, the role that positive and negative emotions um, uh, in engaging adult students um, in the foreign language class play. I'll also be referring to some key insights into the impact that emotional processes have on memory. So maybe as an answer to the, the question that, that Earl um, Stevig is raising here. But I do need to stress, as, as those of you who know me uh, know, uh, that I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a language teaching uh, methodologist. I've, um, the, the insights, uh, or most of the neuroscientific insights I have gained um, have come from the work of James Zull, a professor of neurobiology at Case Western University in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I've drawn on his books and on our intensive discussions while uh, working together on a, on a book project, it's still an ongoing project. Our working title is The Brain, Emotions, and uh, Language Learning. Successful language learners, when you talk to, to your students who are successful, and I'm sure you have many of those students in your classroom, they often, or your classrooms, they often uh, refer to the learning process itself or the language they are learning as giving them pleasure. Um, I've, I've recently held an interview with a young adult student. He's, uh, when I held the interview, he was 17 and a half. Um, a friend of mine who is actually his teacher uh, pointed out to me that he has this student in his class in, in Vienna, in Austria, who has successfully learned six languages, um, uh, two of which he learned at school and four he learned um, himself. And, and uh, I, I was very keen. I, I immediately asked if I could interview uh, this young guy. And he, uh, he, he was an amazing source of, of wisdom. Actually, he almost blew me. The first thing he said was, he quoted Wittgenstein, you will see in a, in a moment. So I asked him, you know, what motivates you uh, to learn languages? And he said, my interest in languages arose when I started to read lots of books and watch um, lots of films and listen to music. But I didn't understand the original languages in them, and I hated that. What Wittgenstein said about the limits of my language being the limits of my world has always meant a lot. Uh, to me. And he continues, when I first learned English and Italian, I noticed that with each of these languages, I gained a new insight into reality, and that was a fantastic feeling. I'm keen on having as many perspectives of, of reality as possible. And then, when I learned Arabic, another and completely different uh, new world opened up to me. And he goes on talking about what it is that he, that he gets um, um, uh, the kind of pleasure he gets uh, from languages. It's obviously, as you will see, it's the sound of languages I love, he says. And I'm totally in love with the sound of Arabic. I had a friend once uh, who was from Palestine, and I used to ask her to read books aloud to me. 
We used to sit in a cafe and she would read to me and that was how I learned to speak Arabic. What a beautiful experience that was. The opposite can of course happen too. Learning a foreign language can be a painful and frustrating experience for some of our students, triggering negative emotions, as we can um, see from the following quotation here, uh, which I found on a chat site where students exchange their language learning experiences. I don't want to read this out because I don't want to, to mock and ridicule a student who is obviously suffering from his language learning experience. So I'll just ask you to, to uh, take a minute and, or, or a few seconds and, and read this. So it's a clear reference to, to feelings, to feelings that are obviously not very positive, you know, feeling ashamed, blushing, being inhibited, feeling awful probably about oneself. If we uh, could talk to this student um, a bit more, we would probably find that. On rare occasions, such negative emotions can actually be transformed into powerful motivational uh, factors in the learning process. But most of the time, they will do nothing but hamper a student's learning and may lead to the uh, student eventually giving up uh, what they wanted to learn or dropping out of a course. I'm sure that everyone in this room um, has come across such sad incidents. And as teachers, of course, we, we suffer uh, when they actually happen. Anyway, time forbids to um, forbids me to discuss negative emotions uh, in this talk, and I will instead focus on student engagement through positive emotions. In order to shed light on why emotions um, play such a crucial um, uh, role in language learning, I believe what we need to elaborate on first is probably the single most uh, important discovery about how the the brain actually works. Whenever we learn, our brain uh, changes. We can understand this by looking at the brain um, in a new way. Many, many people, also um, teachers, um, have got the idea that our brain is a sort of um, container whose job it is just to, to store information that teachers pour into it and that uh, students later on need to, to retrieve. Um, well, actually, it's, it is not like that. It's not, it's not uh, such a simple, uh, th this metaphor, this simple metaphor, does not, is not really in line with what um, your sciences uh, have come up with. This slide, well, yeah, no. Okay, this slide um, shows you a part of the frontal cortex uh, it's actually normally called the, the um, gray matter, the, the part of the brain that I'd like to point your attention to. Here it's pink, I have no idea why. <laughs> it's the pink matter for the time being. Um, the, the, the pink matter, the gray matter, uh, or also called the, the neocortex, is the, from an evolutionary point of view, the youngest part of the human brain. Um, this part is responsible for all kinds of higher order thinking. It's the skin over the brain. It's about three to five millimeters uh, thick. Um, it's responsible for higher order, sophisticated thinking, analyzing, making plans, giving motor commands, spatial reasoning, conscious thought, um, and of course, um, uh, meta-linguistic um, cognition, thinking about language. These are the, the brain functions that the animals don't usually have, or at least not to such a sophisticated um, degree as, as humans do. The neocortex, um, as, as you know, is, is um, and as we can see from here, it's folded. And the basic idea is uh, when you take a piece of paper and you crinkle it, uh, it becomes smaller. In other words, we can get more of this tissue into a relative limited space like the 
the human um, skull. Uh, what we can see here from this image, I got this from uh, James Zoll, is actually four photographs. They, they're pretty um, rare to uh, these, these photographs of um, tiny, tiny, tiny strips of neocortex. So we can see uh, four bits of neocortex from uh, babies' brains at different stages uh, in their development. Uh, if I can read this correctly, it says three months, five months, or six months, uh, 18 and 24 um, months. Um, uh, the older the child gets, obviously, the more growth there is in the cortex. Now, you can see these, these dark dots here. They are the so-called uh, neurons or, or nerve cells. And what we can see growing between them is what neuroscientists call uh, neuronal uh, networks. We can clearly see there's been a change here. Uh, there is growth as the child is getting older. And from what we know, there's one reason for this growth. And that uh, reason is learning. Without learning, there wouldn't be growth. There would be no change in the brain. Sal's research stresses that the brain changes physically. And we can actually see that happen. Of course, uh, these, these tiny strips, I forgot to say, have been enlarged um, uh, quite significantly. Um, so uh, Zal also stresses that the change, the growth, uh, is most extensive and powerful when emotion is part of the learning process, which seems to strongly, by the way, um, support Stevick's observation about the importance of depth, as he called it, in the language learning uh, process. Uh, Zal explains uh, further when he says the chemicals of emotion, oops, the chemicals of emotion such as adrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine act by modification of synapses, and modification of synapses is the very root of learning. So these, what looks like bushes in our back gardens, they grow uh, as a result of a chemical and also electric process. Um, um, which is, is uh, initiated by the release of um, those and other hormones, basically, uh, in the human uh, brain. It's the neuronal networks in the brain that are used to store information. So it's not a container where we pour information in. As Sal points out, there is a, a neuronal network in the brain for everything uh, we learn. When our students learn, I don't know, a new lexical set, when they uh, begin to develop an understanding of a new grammar uh, construct, um, um, what happens is that a new network or new networks are, are connected. And of course, learning only works well uh, if whatever they're learning um, uh, gets connected through neuronal networks with prior knowledge so that it's not simply um, a collection of isolated bits of information but um, we, we get this integration of what they're learning with what they already uh, knew. Networks get uh, connected with, with other uh, networks. But we do not only um, use our neural networks for information storage. Um, we use them when we um, recall information and when we are creative, when we produce new things. Uh, which is, uh, of course, a, a very, very important um, uh, factor in learning. Uh, Zal compares those networks with the plants we have in our back um, gardens as a, as a metaphor. Now, now, the question, of course, is um, what is the fertilizer that makes those networks um, grow? And the answer is emotional engagement. Um, from the research in, in cognitive um, neuroscience, it's become clear that our brains physically flood themselves with those emotion chemicals, those substances like dopamine, adrenaline, and, and serotonin. Um, they are also called uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, and they get released when somebody gets um, emotionally 
uh, engaged. And their, their fundamental function, as I've said, is to change uh, the capabilities of the neuronal networks, both uh, qualitatively and, and quantitatively. Thus, at, at this point, we have arrived at two conclusions, which people some, somehow find uh, rather startling. The first one is that uh, learning is a physical process caused by electric and chemical um, um, stimuli, if you like. And uh, the second one is that the brain, as uh, James Sall stresses, is actually an organ governed by emotion. Um, so the question is um, if joy and happiness and boredom and, and frustration have an influence on the, on the growth um, of, of these neural networks. Um, what's behind that? And, and, and can we as teachers influence those processes in any ways? In other words, is there something we can do in our lessons that supports uh, the, the, the formation of those, those networks, so to speak? Neuroscientific uh, research uh, actually suggests that we can. The brain has um, two very ancient um, emotion centers. They're very ancient. They, they go back to our early, early, early days of, de of development. Uh, one is the, the so-called amygdala, the fear system. Uh, the other one is the, the nucleus accumbens, the, the pleasure system. Uh, and the pleasure system is also the brain's own reward center. The pleasure system is at work when a student, for example, like the student I quoted at the beginning of this talk, when a student enjoys their learning process and they're successful at their learning and they have, mark my words, a rewarding feeling that they get from learning successfully and we have this um, uh, positive um, uh, cycle, of course. But, but what does that mean? Does it mean as teachers we we have to make sure that there's enough fun in our lessons and that's, and that's it. Well, it's, it's not that simple, of course, because what we are talking about here is learning and learning involves the parts of the brain that are responsible for cognition and the process requires more sophisticated uh, brain functions uh, than wanting to have fun does. Some people also claim that in order to, to learn successfully, all we need to do is practice, okay? There's this saying that neurons that um, fire together, wire together, in other words, um, all we need to do is involve our students in, in enough practice and then they will um, remember. But we also know if a student is almost like forced to practice and practice and practice, practice can achieve almost the opposite effect. If there is no personal engagement, if there is no emotional, positive emotional engagement in the, in the practice process, then this often doesn't, doesn't uh, get us the, the results we hope to get um, as this, this um, Gary Larson uh, cartoon actually shows. I don't know if you can see that back there, so I'm going to, to read it out. Um, we have a dog owner talking to his dog here, and the, the, the headline is what we say to dogs. And the owner says, OK, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage, understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. And the second part of this lovely cartoon says what they hear. Blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. Okay, so it goes in one ear, it goes out, out the other, and all the dog hears is ginger. So we need to make sure we get enough ginger into our lessons, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, if, if we are um, aiming at engaging our, our students more emotionally with longer lasting learning and memory effects, um, we can definitely get some useful pointers from neurosciences to the key principles we need to adhere to in our teaching. Nothing may be absolutely new to you. I, I don't expect uh, neuroscientists to come up with any new um, um, secrets, any new completely method, if you, if you uh, like. Um, but I think uh, 
there are some very useful pointers that also explain, give, give um, uh, explanations as to what we are already doing very successfully and why it works well and what we might want to, to uh, change. Firstly, there is evidence that when it comes to learning, um, our brain doesn't reward us for getting the answer right. It rewards us for understanding. If you, for example, if you think of a, a simple example, you're doing a true-false activity with your, with your students, if they're lucky, they can guess 50% without understanding anything. Now, a student who, who leaves the classroom after a test like that, they might be happy that they've gained 50%, but they will not really have a lot of joy um, uh, connected with uh, being successful because they know they have basically cheated or, or guessed. In other words, we get this feeling of being rewarded if we and when we understand. Understanding, not understanding can be threatening, whereas understanding means we are contributing to our own survival and that is what the, the brain is most interested in. Um, the brain is there to support uh, our survival as humankind, but also, of course, the individual's um, uh, survival. Um, this means, of course, that we as students also need to challenge our students at right level, uh, not too little, that is, and not too much, as in Goldilocks. We know that students who, who uh, and that's certainly not a new claim, but we know that students uh, who don't get challenged enough will feel bored, Students um, uh, who, who get challenged too much will feel uh, frustrated. So, so, so we have either um, you know, inertia or we have the, the amygdala, the, the negative emotion center kicking in. We need the right level of, of challenge um, for our students. Um, uh, Jacobs and, and Farrell in their new book on, on ELT talk actually um, about uh, the development of thinking skills in ELT as one of eight what they call paradigm shifts. So, so a, a, a focus on developing thinking skills at the same time as we uh, teach language. And there has been a noticeable movement um, recently also towards engaging students oops, in, in what is called um, critical thinking. No, I wanted to go back not to this one, um, critical thinking or um, also higher order thinking. Secondly, neuroscience uh, stresses the importance of relevance, which according to Stevik again, um, is the connection we make between something we perceive outside ourselves and something um, within us. When we regard something as, as relevant um, to us, that connection is made, and the brain actually releases those, those emotion uh, chemicals. We see that also, just to, to give an, a, an example, when we go to a museum or a gallery, um, we, we, we might look at, at a range of exhibits. Some of them don't speak to us. Some of them just don't engage us emotionally, while others, we look at them and something happens there, something clicks, we find this image or this sculpture would have you as, as emotionally um, engaging. Some, some people can, can even almost feel the physical effects that the release of those, those chemicals actually have on them. But definitely whether we do become aware of those uh, effects or not, we know that uh, positive emotional engagement um, forms lasting and long-lasting memory. When we look at something that engages us, uh, experience something that engages us emotionally, we remember it longer, we remember it better. Um, for us as language teachers, relevance obviously has to do with the content of our, our lessons, uh, with the, the, the reading text, with the listening texts uh, that we want our students to, to um, uh, read or, or listen to. Relatively easy to get right, I, I think, for adult students if, there are, if they are um, in an EAP or ESP uh, class. In general English, maybe not always so easy. 
uh, especially when students are at, at lower language uh, levels and their content um, relevance can be quite a big um, a challenge um, for us. The third point, I'll come back to this in a, in a moment. The third point is that Zal argues that there may be a connection between the release of, of dopamine um, and action, both physical action and mental action, imagined action, imagined um, uh, movement also, as he, he calls it. Um, according to his arguments, students um, enjoy a successful learning process because there is movement um, inherent um, in it, or progress, um, uh, metaphorically speaking. This happens, for example, when we get engaged in a process that starts with facing a challenge, when we are in a problem situation and we need to solve a problem, we, we move from a stuck state towards a solution. So there, metaphorically speaking, there is there is uh, progress. Sal actually says success is progress towards a goal and nothing succeeds like success and we know that from our students. This could be one of the most important aspects of intrinsic motivation. Achievement itself is rewarding and that may simply be because it's recognized as movement um, by the brain. We see that also when we read um, narratives. Um, when we read narratives, of course, we don't move normally when we watch a good movie or when we, 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 we read a book. Oops, it's getting stuck here. Uh, but, but Sal says here what actually happens. You know, it's one o'clock in the morning. You can't put that book down, although you know you should be going to sleep because you have a, a challenging day tomorrow. Uh, but what happens is we are so... Um, emotionally engaged because we want to know where the story goes. We want to know the direction the story goes. And he says, my argument is that we get enjoyment and satisfaction through anticipation of movement and imagined movement. In fact, this is probably the most important thing that keeps us reading a good book or watching a movie. We want something to happen or we're curious about what will happen, anticipated movement. And we are, of course, delighted when the story moves in the right direction and disappointed when it um, doesn't. Um, so what I would like you, just as a, as a short reference experience, if you don't mind, I would, I'm going to ask you to, to observe your own cognitive process now, maybe also your emotional engagement. I'm going to present to you a, a piece of text in a very unnatural way. I'm going to show you the first sentence only, and then I will pause. And while I'm pausing, I would like to ask you to ask yourself what do I expect next? Or where do I hope the story goes in terms of the direction uh, it will take? Okay, ready? And we have one more bit. If we had the time and if this was a, a small audience, we could now actually discuss um, which the points were, where each of us was most uh, engaged emotionally and what we were expecting at, 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 at which point. This is actually uh, from a true story. It's the, the story of... Um, uh, what's his name, uh, Johnny Peacock, who, who won uh, the gold medal at the 100 meter race at the London Paralympics in, in 2012. And, and students usually get very inspired and, and emotionally engaged when they read um, texts like, like this. Uh, ELT has over the, the last three decades maybe seen a radical change as far as the texts used in, in the foreign language class are concerned. Uh, in the olden days, Course books, for example, 
uh, used to offer lots of texts that Henry Widdowson once called artificial and pragmatically meaningless. Um, one of the outcomes of this, this change is that we are now finding more real English in course books. And it is the teaching materials for the adult classroom uh, that I believe are at the forefront of this development. And there seems to be a belief also among um, materials writers uh, that teaching materials for adults need to be serious. I almost said boring. In order um, uh, for adult learners to take them, them seriously. At the same time, it's not uncommon to hear teachers um, uh, comment about a lack of lighter content in, in current course books. And I'm talking about course books for lower level adult students in general English uh, classrooms. Uh, Peter Magius, for example, um, having carefully analyzed ELT materials, notices that they're lacking in humor. He stresses that including more humor among other things eases tension in the classroom, strengthens motivation, has a positive effect on the group dynamics, and helps foster the students' uh, creativity. An interesting theory about the development of the, the human mind comes from educational philosopher Kieran Egan. It may give a further explanation as to why a feeling of safety is such an important precondition for learning. And it may guide us towards an understanding of what kinds of texts would maybe be more relevant to our adult students, especially in the early stages of their foreign language learning, than those that we currently find in lots of um, teaching materials. Egan postulates that um, um, a person's intellectual growth happens naturally through the um, acquisition of certain what he calls intellectual um, qualities or developments, uh, which are deeply rooted in our, um, in humankind's cultural history. In order for an individual's uh, intellect to grow appropriately, the development of certain cognitive tools, he uses a term coined by, by Lev Vygotsky in his learning theories, uh, is essential. Um, the, the next slides, I will just basically um, uh, uh, browse through them very quickly. We don't have to time to, to, to go into them. But they show a very basic summary of his ideas, um, which could serve, I believe, as a basis for understanding how the human mind develops from, from childhood to adult years. He talks about uh, different stages in our development from, from um, early uh, years at, at primary level uh, towards um, adolescence, upper secondary, pre-university, and, and finally, that's us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the ironic um, understanding. Um, uh, I mean, let me, let me briefly share a, an, an embarrassing personal anecdote here. It was a few years ago, I started to learn Italian as a foreign language. I'd always liked Italian, it, it sounds so beautiful, so I thought it's now time, I would like to learn Italian. And um, a few months into the learning process, a, a friend uh, gave me an Italian, a reader, one of those simplified stories that publishers uh, publish. It was a pretty lightweight, um, what shall I say, um, schmaltzy, um, cheap romance story actually. Not something I would normally read, and yet I loved the story. <laughs> I devoured every single word, and I, I got real satisfaction from reading it. I surprised myself, and I thought, what is going on here? I'm reading with great delight a story I would not even touch in the language I, I read um, well in. Well, what actually happened was that I had my doubts I would be able to read my first book, and it wasn't a real book, it was a booklet, uh, in, in the language I was learning. I was delighted that I was actually able to make meaning and was able to follow and understand. Okay, so in terms of, of Kieran Egan's theory, understanding demanding texts is impossible without fairly sophisticated language knowledge and language skills. But my Italian was at elementary level. So 
with the higher echelons of, of um, ironic understanding and philosophical thinking, um, sadly inaccessible to me at that elementary level of my target uh, language. One explanation for the pleasure I got out from reading um, this, this undemanding text was um, uh, that uh, there was, I got a sense of movement from it. I, I was able to read it, I was able to, to get engaged in the process of anticipating where the story was going. So, so this, uh, this emotional engagement uh, was actually there. I have a theory based on classroom observation which is about the frustration that um, some adult students get at the early stages of learning uh, a new language. It happens when they notice that they're not able to easily access certain text types um, that, um, they, that are in line with their expectations, their intellectual expectations of themselves, or when uh, they want to express themselves adequately and intellectually appropriately in the language they're learning, but can't. The result, inevitably, uh, seems to be a certain degree of cognitive regression uh, into a state of mind, I believe, of a lower stage of development um, um, when we look at um, uh, those stages that Kieran Egan uh, sets out there, um, which we might argue is actually needed in order to develop the necessary sense of security that students need for successful learning. So, um, what I'm actually suggesting here uh, when it comes to general English and lower level classrooms, I'm not talking about, um, I don't know, medical students um, uh, doing their, their last year before their PhD. Um, I'm not talking about those, those uh, students. I'm talking about early uh, stages, uh, students of, of a lower level of, of the foreign language they're learning. Um, what I believe we need to use there is, is lighter content. Um, support for such an argument also comes from a study on uh, flow theory. Flow, according to Csikszentmihalyi, uh, is a state of experience that is characterized by intense focus and leads to excellence in the performance of a task. Um, this is um, a photo I took. In a bookshop, I don't know about you, I have a Kindle, but I still prefer the real thing when it comes to reading. I even love smelling uh, books. Um, this photo I took in a bookshop on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I, I gave a talk uh, in that bookshop. And I took that photo just before, before closing hours, but actually during the day, the, the bookshop was chock-a-block with people. And I took another photo of a rather remarkable situation. I'll show you the photo in a minute. I, I was walking through the bookshop and I was really delighted and I saw in that bookshop a little girl. She was tucked away in a corner. She had taken a book and she was reading. This is the photo. I, it's a blurred photo. I, I blurred it because I didn't know who her parents were. I couldn't ask them for permission to, to use the photo. Okay, That's why I blurred it. So she was reading there and she was completely undisturbed by all the chaos and all the noise. So uh, she is, uh, in a way, I think a perfect example of what Joy Eckbert in her study on flow theory in the foreign language classroom um, calls focused attention. And there is a study by McQuillan and Cond about what kind of texts support uh, this inner state? What kind of texts help our student at first and second year at university to, at university to get into this inner um, state of focused attention, as Joy Egbert uh, calls it? And, and McQuillan and Conde actually conclude that most of the texts that supported flow were those that participants had read for their own enjoyment, ones, ones in which they had interest, and those in narrative form, partly because it was easier to focus on these um, texts. So for a change, why not use with those students um, content elements such as um, humor, strong emotional contrasts, inspiring stories about, about real uh, life heroes and heroines, such as the one about uh, this, this, this runner that I uh, presented previously. 
uh, texts about the extreme, um, the absurd, and the, the weird and wonderful, at least at the earlier stages of the learning process. Another key point has to do with the images we use in our, our lessons. When it, we look at the images currently used in teaching materials, they're all beautiful. And sometimes they are even the same because they come from the same agencies. They're beautiful, but there is also a certain blandness about them. There, there's, there's some, some beautiful blandness um, about them, actually. So um, the question is, shouldn't we use images that go somewhere, metaphorically speaking? Shouldn't we use images that actually trigger off uh, more than just student kind of like saying, this is beautiful? Uh, have a look at two images here, if you don't mind. Um, a and B, and tell me which of the two images you think is more likely to trigger off uh, from our students uh, this emotional engagement, a, a curiosity where the picture is going, so to speak. A or B? Yeah, I don't think we need to discuss this. It's, it's, it's pretty clear, isn't it? This one is, is beautiful. But it's an agency photo. It could be used in any advertisement. And by the way, I was in Cyprus three days ago. I was driving with, with Devrim when suddenly I saw on a billboard this image. <laughs> Only watch it where, where there were a few glasses of water in the picture I had. There is now a certain soft drink that shall not be named. Okay, um, so the fourth of the, the key principles pointed to uh, by the neurosciences um, is ownership. We know that little children, um, when, when we want to do things for them, at certain stages in their development say, I want to do it myself. They, 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 they need that. They need the sense of being able to do things um, themselves. Um, so um, that's a, a very, very important thing that has to do with, um, with, with creativity. It has to do uh, with expressing ourselves in the foreign language class. We know, of course, that, that learning a language successfully is not about reciting the 900 dialogues our students had in their course books by heart. We know that they need to go beyond that. They need the ability, they need the language they learned there, but they need the ability to go, to go beyond uh, those, those blueprints of, of uh, interaction. Um, so what we actually need also in the classroom, we need experimental learning processes where this appropriation process can actually happen. Uh, I'm using a term um, uh, coined by Scott Thornbury, who says learning a skill is not simply He's talking about the development of speaking skill. Learning a skill is not simply a behavior like practice or a mental process like restructuring. Central to the notion of transfer of control is the idea that aspects of the skill are appropriated. Appropriation has connotations of taking over the ownership of something, of making something one's own. We, we want our students to make the uh, foreign language or the, ne the new language they're learning their own, of course, okay? Now, of course, this means that um, our students will need to experiment with the language. Th this means that um, the fallacy of um, error-free learning just doesn't work. It means that uh, error-free learning needs to be replaced with phases where error-welcoming modes of engagement are, are not only possible but, but um, uh, integrated and uh, this also means a partial uh, move from instruction led pedagogy. I'm not against instruction uh, at all. I'm also not against uh, phases where, where it is the teacher who is the boss in the classroom but we also need phases of course where our students can um, uh, experiment in a hands-on and, and, and minds-on um, way. Okay, now let me um, summarize um, what we've been looking at in terms of the positive emotional um, systems of our students' brains. So we said emotional engagement, first of all,
comes from, from challenge. Um, the second point is engagement comes from content that is relevant to our students. In other words, is seen as important for our students, important for their own future, uh, that is. Thirdly, we need to make sure that students get plenty of opportunities for what James Sall calls anticipated um, uh, movement. Um, uh, this has got to do with another point that I will add briefly then. Uh, point number four, let's uh, make sure we give our students plenty of learning experiences that make them aware that they own the language. They are gradually uh, gaining more and more control over it. And I have added two points here that I didn't have the time um, to, to discuss really, but uh, they are two points that are that, uh, definitely not new claims, but they're extremely important. Um, the, the, the role that, um, this is a relatively new term, learning-oriented assessment, uh, assessment as an ongoing uh, process that helps students to, to get a sense of their progress and helps the teacher to decide what to do next in the classroom that these, these um, factors um, uh, play. And last but not least, of course, um, we will get our students more emotionally engaged if we manage to um, get them to develop what some people call personal response ability. I would like to, to um, finish uh, this talk uh, by quoting the student again who has the 18-year-old the who has successfully learned um, six languages. Uh, you remember in the, in the first quote I, I used, he was talking about the pleasure he gets from language itself or from certain aspects of the language. And, and here at this point in the interview, I asked him uh, what he thought uh, teachers should do or what advice um, he could give to teachers. And, and uh, this is what he uh, said. He said, I think teachers should be encouraged to forget the idea I have to teach the language in exchange for I want my students to learn the language by showing them what the attraction of language is. A teacher has to make the language interesting, and that's the same with other subjects, of course. The thing is, though, he says, that if you are a teacher of biology, all you have to hand in order to make biology interesting is biology per se. But with languages, it's different. Language is about culture. It's about music. It's about film. It's about literature. It's about people. It's about you and me. Thank you very much.